Hello and welcome to Biology Explained. Today we're going to be talking about how moss and lichens can be used as bioindicators to tell us about how badly humans are impacting their environment. Now everyone knows the story of the canary, which was taken down into the mine shaft. Their small lung capacity and simple breathing system made them very susceptible to carbon monoxide and methane gas before their human companions realised. They served as one of the first used biological indicators to show unsafe conditions. Now, all species of organisms can only tolerate a certain range of conditions, which allows us to tell, use them to tell us about how humans impact are having on their surroundings. And this is a key factor in what is a bioindicator. Bioindicators include biological processes, species or communities, and they're used to assess the quality of the environment and how it changes over time. Changes in the environment are often attributed to human disturbances, such as pollution or land use changes, or they could also be natural stresses, such as drought or lake spring freezing. However, most bioindicators are used to assess the human's impact on their environment. However, not all biological processes, species or communities can serve as successful bioindicators. So what makes a good bioindicator? A good bioindicator is a species that's not too rare, that has two narrow tolerances because they're often sensitive to environmental change, that's why they're a rare species. So if the environment is changing too much, they die out. They don't tell you very much. And same way with a too infrequently encountered species, if there's not very many of them, they're not gonna give you an accurate reading of the environmental conditions because they're only sporadically spread out over an area. While species that are in abundance with very broad tolerances are less sensitive to environmental changes, which otherwise disturb the rest of the community, meaning Looking at them as a bioindicator doesn't really tell you very much because they can withstand a broad range of conditions. So you need to find a species which is kind of in the middle. It's not too rare, so you can get an accurate sample size, and it's not like too narrow of environmental conditions that it doesn't reflect the rest of the populations of other species around, but not too common and too kind of immune to environmental changes that it doesn't really tell you anything about what possibly has happened to other species. So it's about looking at a kind of a middle of the road organism which can you know reflect changes but in enough of a sample size that it's accurate and kind of you can stretch it to both species that have higher abundance or species that have lower abundance. You can even go as far as to use biological processes even within an individual to act as a bioindicator. For example cutthroat trout inhabit cold water streams of the western United States. Most individuals have an upper thermal tolerance of 20 to 25 degrees, meaning above that they start to kind of suffer the issues essentially, which means they stay away from that temperature or they end up suffering and maybe even dying. Their temperature sensitivity can be used as a bioindicator of water temperature. Specifically, they produce heat shock protein when there's higher temperatures, which allows them to be protected from these higher temperatures. And so you can directly measure the quantities of heat shock protein that these fish are producing to kind of gauge the temperature of the water they're in and therefore that tells you what is having an impact on the water and there you can work out what is having an impact on the water. Now examples of environmental, ecological and biodiversity indicators can be found in many different organisms inhabiting many different environments. Lichens, a symbiosis among fungi, algae and or cyanobacteria and bryophytes, which are mosses and liverworts, are often used to assess kind of bioindicator and environmental impacts. Lichens and bryophytes serve as effective bioindicators of air quality because they have no roots, no cuticle, and acquire all their nutrients from direct exposure to the atmosphere. Therefore, their high surface area to volume ratio further encourages the interception and accumulation of contaminants from the air. So they're essentially very susceptible to kind of taking in air pollutants meaning they're very sensitive to any changes in their environment, so that's what makes them a really good bioindicator. And so we can use those organisms, mosses, lichens, other organisms as bioindicators, but what makes these bioindicators better than using traditional kind of physical, electronic, scientific methods of collecting data? Why use an organism? Scientists have traditionally conducted chemical assays and directly measured physical parameters of the environment, such as ambient temperature, salinity, nutrients, pollutants, availability of light, and etc., etc., to kind of tell you how much humans, the, the impact humans are having on the environment, to get like direct measurements. And so, why wouldn't we do that? Why would we use an organism? 
whereas the use of bioindicators uses the biota to assess accumulative impacts of both chemical pollutants and habitat alterations over time. Therefore, bioindicators are fundamentally different ways of measuring pollution and environmental quality to physical methods, and they offer numerous advantages. Firstly, bioindicators kind of add a temporal component, a time-related component corresponding to the lifespan of the organism in a particular area. This allows the integration of current past or future events and conditions. In, in contrast, many chemical or physical measurements may characterize conditions at the exact time of measuring, while using a bioindicator allows you to kind of take in a, last, a vast amount of time that means you don't have to do it when you're doing a physical direct measurement. So you could come back and repeatedly measure an area over a specific time physically using your proper scientific measurements, or you could use a bioindicator that's already lived in this area for 10, 20, 50 years and get all that data straight away. So it's a lot faster and takes in a time component. It also allows you to increase the probability of catching kind of sporadic brief pulses of pollutants occurring, which may appear and disappear too quickly between your uh, measurements if you're measuring it properly, like scientifically. In addition, contaminants can occur in exceedingly low concentrations, meaning they're hard to measure or you measure them in low concentrations and don't think very much about it. Tedious analysis with highly sensitive technologies are really expensive and are required to detect such low concentrations. So there's a cost factor in this as well, which makes it kind of prohibited to go and measure lots of different areas. Another benefit of the use of bioindicators is their ability to indicate indirect biotic effects of pollutants when many physical or chemical measurements cannot. Indirect contamination effects are especially difficult to glean from chemical or physical measurements. In the case of biochemication, metals, among many other contaminants, accumulate in biological organisms, causing metal concentrations to amplify throughout the food webs. These contamination levels of higher trophic levels may be underrepresented by physical or chemical measurements because you're only measuring kind of the baseline. But if it's working its way up the trophic levels, these like low levels of contaminants may end up affecting bigger organisms, which you may not be realizing at the time. And therefore it's a great way of kind of working out how much of this contamination is getting into the lower end of the food web, and then you can work out how much is getting into the higher end of the food web. And so that's some reason why bioindicators are kind of useful compared to measurements. Cost, working out kind of further food web uh, changes, and also kind of a time benefit, meaning you don't have the sample as much uh, yourself. And also it can tell you more about sporadic kind of pollution events, which you may miss if you're kind of coming back every like six months or something like that. And so they have their benefits. And moss and lichen especially, if you're out walking and you're in an area where there's not much moss, moss and lichen, you're not gonna find very much moss and lichen in a city because the pollution is so high. And you can tell an area has nice clean air and low levels of pollution if there's lots of moss and lichen around. And that tends to be in an area like the countryside and things like that. And so I hope that's given you a bit of food for thought and kind of explained a kind of biological fact to you. Lichen and moss, they do show something. They show you're in a nice clean environment with low levels of pollution. So have a think about that next time you're out for a walk. Please like and subscribe. Stay tuned for more videos. Thank you.